All right, good morning, everybody. In the interest of time, we'll get starting uh, started. Welcome to this, um, this webinar for Open Access Week. Uh, run by Open Access Australasia. So I'm Ginny Barber, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia and I'm really delighted to be um, uh, uh, a part of this session today. Um, so I'm just gonna just do go through some of the logistics um, and then we'll get started with the speakers. So just the usual, we will be recording and we'll share this um, recording on our website afterwards and it will have a CC BY license on it. Um, please keep your microphone uh, muted and your cameras turned off. Um, you're very welcome to type questions into the chat. Please do. Any links that you think would be of interest, um, are, you're welcome to put, post them there. I'll be asking some questions, but you can also put your questions in the chat there as well. And we'll aim to end on time. So just um, before we start, I would like to um, pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on. Um, I'm based in Mianjin in Brisbane, uh, which is the lands of the Turbul and the Yagra people. And Open Access Australasia is an organisation that works across Australia and out here in New Zealand, and pays our respect to elders past, present, um, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders yeah. and Indigenous people who may be here today. Um, we also pay our respect to, in particular, to um, Maori people in uh, Aotearoa New Zealand. We are particularly delighted that we're an organisation that works across both Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand. You're welcome to put your where you're from in the chat. So um, just to start off, I'm going to introduce uh, this session very briefly. Um, so. Thank you for joining the session. Um, it came out of discussions that I've had with um, colleagues about how, as we move to um, a more open science and a op more open data world, we can really ensure that the data generated, especially really complex data to high volume, uh, is not weaponized to throw doubt on the evidence or misused in other ways. We know this has been a problem in uh, many areas, but potentially, potentially, particularly in climate science, we know that it is a particular issue. And as we move to a world where we need to be taking really clear action on climate science, how we can ensure that uh, the science is trusted is something that I think um, is a really important topic for us to consider as a, as a community. So I'm really delighted to say that we have three speakers here today to talk about this from their perspective. Um, um, I'll introduce uh, just in order. So Andy Pittman, who is the Professor Andy Pittman, Director of the ARC Centre for Excellence in Climate Extremes at the U University of New South Wales. Um, Dr. Tanya Fiedler, who is the um, uh, from the Business School at the University of Sydney, who's an accountant interested in interdisciplinary approaches to measuring and delivering sustainable outcomes. And Professor Ian White from the University of Waikato, Professor of Environmental Planning and Social Scientist, um, the Associate Dean for Arts, Law and Psychology and Social Science. So we have, we're looking forward to a really diverse discussion. So we'll kick off first with um, uh, Andy Pittman and uh, we will uh, take questions as we go at the end of all the talks. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Ginny. Uh, so I was asked to talk about open access in climate science. Well, as, as most of you would know, climate science is rather sadly somewhat politicized, uh, depending on the country you live in. And in climate science, that led to, in the 90s, a perception that we were extreme risk of hacking and cyber attacks. In part, in, as a response to that, but also in part because climate science problems are internationalized and need global scale uh, 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 approaches and in part because of the social awareness that the climate science community has of who funds our science the de, de facto standard in climate science is now open access to codes and data perhaps the leading example of our strategies around open sharing of data in climate science is the coupled model intercomparison project phase six or CMIP six, which is a international uh, consortium of uh, climate modeling groups all the way around the world. And that has generated a multi petabyte data set that served on what's called the Earth System Grid and is basically created by scientists for the fundamental purpose of understanding the science, trying to understand how our climate works, why our climate models agree or sometimes disagree. In other words, this multi petabyte data set is created fundamentally as a science driven and science enabling strategy. In parallel with that, and quite independent of the climate science community, 
governments, regulatory authorities, and so on, have recognized climate change as a risk to a whole variety of sectors, including business, industry, institu financial institutions, and so on. And understandably, all of those organizations that have perceived a climate risk have sought to understand their exposure to climate change and climate risk, which is a good thing for them to be doing, of course. Now, our petascale data that served globally is really easy to access and process. It's in NetCDF, which is a self-describing uh, data format. It's in compressed binary. And if you have some basic skills, which aren't common in business, Excel is not an option. But if you have some basic programming skills, it's very easy to mine those data. As a consequence of the demand for climate risk assessments at a finer spatial scale, climate service providers have emerged. These organizations, companies, consultancy companies, mine the CMIP6 data and other climate data and package things up in a variety of interesting ways which are very attractive to business. Now, with exceptions, there are exceptions, these climate service providers provide professionally impressive reports, beautifully crisp graphics, simplified narratives, and high levels of quantitative precision. This contrasts rather dramatically with climate scientists who provide academic papers with complex graphics and complex language with nuanced caveats and huge amounts of uncertainty. So what's been going on is these climate service providers have often, though not always, mining the CMIP6 data, which is all open access, and selling a product that, at least in my judgment, is virtually meaningless, misrepresents the capacity of climate science, confuses accuracy and precision, and means that your taxpayer dollar will go to invest the odd billion dollars on climate change adaptation to the wrong risk. So has climate science done the right thing by making their data open access? Whose job is it to set standards around the use, the misuse or the weaponization of these data? If someone is misusing open access data, are the providers of that data responsible for the misuse of the data? Surely not. But if the data are widely misused and bad decisions are made, that will lead to uh, damage to the reputation of the climate science community. Now, most in my field shrug this off. They shrug their shoulders and point to the crass stupidity of those misusing the data, which is not exactly a good strategy. However, the open access strategy has led to a range of apparent solutions becoming available from the climate service providers that are of order 10 to 20 years ahead of what climate science can do. As a consequence of that, if governments and business believe these solutions are already there and see no pathway, uh, sorry, there would seem therefore to be no pathway to fund the development of the climate science required to actually provide the robust information. In other words, if I can already buy solutions off the shelf, why would you fund the climate science community to develop solutions that might take 20 years? In short, at least in my view, making climate science data open access is a genuinely good thing, which might have the consequences of undermining long-term investment in climate science. That also implies gross misinvestment in climate risk adaptation, as we invest very heavily to mitigate the wrong risks in the wrong places at the wrong time. And I'm not sure what to do about any of that, Changing policies in the global climate science community to withdraw open access is virtually impossible, even if we thought it was a good idea. Uh, changing how things like CMIT work is a decadal challenge, which we probably couldn't embark upon. And so I'm sort of lost as to what to do about it. And so one of the reasons I'm here today is, wait, I'm, I'm seeking advice. How do we deal with a situation where we think the climate science community has done the right thing and that's leading to genuinely perverse outcomes? Thank you.
thanks, Andy. That's really provocative. <laughs> and I, I challenge the audience to have a think about um, the answers to your questions. I think it's um, I think there are some really powerful discussions that we need to have. So thank you for that. Um, we just remind everybody type your questions in the chat um, and uh, we'll come back to them after all the speakers have spoken. Uh, great. Thank you. So next to Tanya. Great. Thanks so much, Virginia. And thank you, uh, Andy. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, right. Can everyone see, see my slides? Yes, that's perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk, uh, sort of motivated by Andy's discussion, I'm going to talk about accountability in the financial system, because really what Andy is, the question that he's asking, very much from the perspective of the scientists and the scientific community is where does the accountability lie? Um, and I would argue some of that lies within the, um, the various players and stakeholders within the financial system. So um, now let's just see, is this going to work? Okay. So um, Andy mentioned um, that we have regulators, so financial regulators, accounting standard setters and so on, who are now really demanding that businesses um, present information relating to the risks that they face as a consequence of the physical effects of climate change. Um, and there's an assumption there that when companies disclose or report on such information that the information that gets measured will be managed, yeah? Um, but there is there is an element of accountability associated with this because obviously, um, and, and also there's a moral uh, uh, sort of underpinning to this because whatever you divulge about your organisation implies that you are responsible for the, what you're divulging. And there's a two-way street in this. So I've, I've got a, a diagram here that um, is a little bit complicated, so I thought I'd sort of break it up a little bit. Um, so we're starting off with this problem of climate change and, and um, we have these regulators, as I mentioned. So we've got like central banks, yeah. So, so this is now uh, the concern that has built in the global financial system around climate change has now so far transcended um, any sense of this being a left-wing, you know, hippie environmental concern, yeah. Um, it's now very, very much the concern of central bankers of bodies like APRA, so the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, also of um, mainstream accounting centers, so the International um, Accounting Standards Board, um, the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States, um, uh, the European Central Bank, I could go on and on. Okay, so, so these, these organizations are deeply concerned that the effects of climate change might um, might be the next, uh, I suppose, cause of a global financial crisis and might affect the financial stability of, of the global financial system um, and also affect individual, obviously, individual organisations. So um, they are now requiring companies, in particular publicly listed companies, as well as those organisations that are regulated, like banks or insurers or also um, investors, um, to provide information in the public domain around the risks that they face as a consequence of climate change. Now, for companies to provide that information, they need to access the data that Andy was referring to. Okay, so straight away we can see there are enormous uh, challenges here. Uh, in, in, in that relationship between the science and, and finance. So what we've come to now, um, so Jesse Keenan, an economist, has termed um, this the climate intelligence arms race. And it is like an arms race because, um, uh, as I think uh, Ginny or Andy used the term um, of weaponising this data. So this data can really be weaponised. It can be used against third parties. Um, it can also be weaponized in the sense that it might be used inappropriately by an organization for itself, because it can effectively interpret that data how it wants, depending on which data it selects to use. Um, and it can also unwittingly do so. Um, so um, now the problem is, 
that these climate service providers that Andy was referring to uh, rely very much on top-down models, okay? So models that really take a global perspective because that is what the financial system wants. Um, if you think about an investor with an investment portfolio, they don't want um, some sort of model that tells them in detail what's going to happen at one particular location. They want to know what's going to, what is going to be affected across their entire portfolio. So this type of model that's being provided by climate service providers is seen very much as a desirable thing because it allows scalability. It allows, apparently, uh, comparability across different risk assessments, comparability across different organisations. It also allows for consistency in the sense that the same model is being employed. Now, these are all desirable characteristics of information that um, uh, would normally um, be attributed to the desirable qualitative, qualitative characteristics of financial information that accountants and auditors um, are seeking. So accountants and auditors want information that is comparable. They want information that is consistent, that is verifiable. But the verifiable aspect is difficult here because who amongst the accountants and auditors is actually qualified to determine whether the information being used is in fact the correct information. There's also a problem in the sense that whilst there's transparency, in that original source data, is there really transparency in the models? Because these models from these climate service providers are proprietary. They're all very different. So across them, we don't have comparability, but we don't actually know um, because we just don't see the information. Now, the next bit of the diagram gets a bit more interesting. So we've got this climate intelligence arms race and this information that's being developed in this arms race is going to all sorts of players within the financial system, okay? So we've got, we've got banks and they're using this information as well as credit ratings, rating agencies to determine the credit risk associated say with um, mortgage holders or for credit rating agencies the credit risk associated with a jurisdiction with a country say with a developing nation yeah um, there there are also um, the insurers who um, uh, need climate information um, and there are also investors now for investors they want that information because they want to know where to allocate their capital. And for insurers, they want to know this information because they want to know, understand, well, what should I insure in the future and what should I not insure? Um, and for corporates, there are issues around, well, where should I build my next assets? Um, are my operations threatened? Is my supply chain threatened as a consequence of climate change? And then in terms of the regulators themselves, there are issues there, as I mentioned at the beginning, around financial stability and also capital adequacy in terms of those regulated businesses uh, like the banks and the investors and insurers and so on. So now I mentioned accountants. OK, so accountants also are facing risk here in, in the sense that they're face, facing information risk. OK, so when accountants publish information to the market, that information can influence how the market behaves. And in a sense, the accountants, are, they're the people we go to to trust to provide us information. There's, there's an enormous amount of trust in the accountancy profession and also in the profession of auditors. And now there are risks arising for auditors as well in the sense that they may be providing opinions about the quality of information that they don't, themselves don't properly understand and they may not understand that they are providing assurance around information that is in fact erroneous in nature. So we have all of these risks that individual players in the financial system are uh, seeking to uh, report against. But at the same time, these risks then come up, there's a potential for these risks to then affect everyone else, okay? So if you think about the bank, yeah, they make a decision, well, we're going to lend money to this mortgagee, but not this mortgagee over there, because this mortgagee we have assessed is not at risk from the financial effect, from the physical effects of climate change, whereas this mortgagee is. But what if they get it wrong? Yeah, and the same for credit rating agencies. What if they get it wrong in assessing that 
this developing nation over here is highly exposed to climate risk when in fact it may not be or it may be less so. The same for investors, they may be misallocating their capital and the same for corporates, they may be making decisions about their supply chain based on incorrect information. So there are real challenges here for the entire financial system that, as Andy suggested, is really a source in itself of systemic financial risk. Now, Andy was asking about some solutions and he, we've had some discussions around this. So there are alternative types of models. And I put in inverted commas there because they're undesirable in the sense that they are bottom up. So they don't have these characteristics of being comparable or um, having um, consistent types of information across different types of assets or operations. Um, but they are desirable in, this, in the sense that they have scientific merit behind them. Um, now, ideally, what you want is to properly assess um, the uh, risk of a business, of an asset. You want a combination of both the um, top-down models that are derived from climate science. I'm not referring to the top-down models here of the climate service providers. I'm talking about the models that Andy was referring to, say from CMIP6. Um, but you also want these bottom-up models that have been informed by, um, by the um, CMIP models, for example. So there are ways to do this, but it's really complicated and very nuanced and requires a very, very high level of skill, ex expertise, um, and judgment. Um, and the question is, who's going to do that? Who's qualified to do that? Is it the accountancy and audit profession who are traditionally the, uh, those who um, are trusted with expertise around information, complex information? Or does it need to be someone else? Um, so that's my question to everyone. Thank you very much, Ginny. Thank you. That was really fascinating. I think, it, again, it's some, those are some great questions. Um, I was thinking that in particular what you, you highlighted there is the fact that, you know, the, the people that are most disadvantaged in this are the people who are currently disadvantaged in the global global finance system. So this Correct. whole issue about climate justice yeah. is, is just really fascinating. Yeah, it, there's enormous issues there around climate justice. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll pass over to Ian White to uh, give the last presentation, then we'll come back to questions at the end. Over to you, Ian. Okay. Hopefully you can um, see that screen. Um, well, uh, we're seeing it in the, we're not seeing it in the presentation. Oh, uh, aren't you? Um, uh, oh, perfect. Yep. Let me try. Again. No, that's perfect now. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, kia ora koutou. thank you for the invitation. Um, my research area is really on the, the politics of uh, science and thinking about the different users who might use that. So um, thinking about the data we produce, how that data turns into information, um, who and how does that, and, and then how that then becomes subsequently integrated into the policy domain, which is quite difficult. Um, Sorry, Ian, I'm just going to interrupt. We can't see your slides. Ah, uh, okay. I think there might, might be a delay. So, yeah. Okay, let me try one more time. Can now. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, start again. Kia ora koutou. Thank you so much for bearing with me and the technical difficulties. Um, I think we've all had a few of those over the last few years. So I'm on the, the politics of um, science and its use and its application, and particularly the difficulties from a policy perspective and the different users who might use that. So um, I'm going to talk about maybe the difficulties in trying to make decisions when the stakes are high. The data might be uncertain, the time scales might be long, and so on. And so the idea of uncertainty just being an ever-present, no matter how rigorous that science is, there's always going to be some doubt. So, for example, from a policy perspective, it might be, okay, who pays? Um, how fast? How frequent? How much? And, and so there's a whole load of, of issues which there's limits to the nature that 
science can provide answers for. So I want to provide just a quick overview of some of the social science perspectives on, on this and then talk about some of the, the research that we're doing at the moment. So one of the one of the things that social science has tried to do probably over the last 30 years or so is to really challenge this idea of a deficit model. So if only there was a gap, a something that needs to be filled, and once we have that, then action occurs, and, and then data is part of this gap. It's not uniformly data. It could be a tool, a policy, a best practice guidance. So there's, there's, there's something lacking after which action will occur, and there's a logic and a, and a rationality to it. But from from about the 1990s onwards, I think uh, colleagues in sociology, um, in particular, and, and geography and other areas started to talk about this is not as rational as our scientific minds sort of lend it to believe. There's issues around culture and ideology and politics and values, which also play a role in how receptive you are to just being open to some of those messages. And then more recently, in the last couple of decades, science and technology studies has really started to disrupt this tension between who creates the knowledge and how, and, and who is uses it. And this idea between expert and lay knowledge is, and you see this with some of the indigenous knowledge tensions going on outside our, at the moment around what is credible and, and so on. And then more recently, I wanted to flag this up because it really maps on well to this topic that we're talking about today is agnotology, which some of you might be familiar with, some of you less so, but it's a relatively new research area which talks about just as we're producing science to illuminate, other people are producing doubt to dim that illumination. And, and it's partly uh, related to some of the, the research that was on big tobacco, and then some of the same tactics in the media get became used with climate change. And, and so we're not only producing uh, data, other people are producing their interpretations of the same data. And once it's out there, it's really hard to manage that. And so um, the other thing I wanted to flag up was just the volume of data. I mean, any, any researcher watching this will struggle to keep up with what's going on in their field. It seems like every year there's more and more information published. And then, so the challenge we have, and this is what you see in, in the rise of this systematic review and, and those kind of aspects is who is the synthesizer of the data? Who's making sense of it for us? And this idea that the data needs someone or groups to make sense of it because it is becoming increasingly complex is a really interesting area and that. So who does the sense making once the data out there? Who does the synthesis between the different data sets? And, and this idea, I quite like this quote from E. O. Wilson, which basically introduces this idea of being data rich, information poor. And that we've, we've never known as much as we have now. And there's a real challenge in, in putting that together. And, and the idea is synthesis. And the world will be run by synthesizers. People are able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. So this is part of the context by which I come at the problem is that the politics of science and data is, is quite, you know, it's quite complicated. And there's lots of actors in that beyond the scientific field as well. This is a, a diagram I used to to try and help make sense of, or to try and explain some of the, 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 the angles I'd come at it from. And it's from a colleague of mine, Sarah Beaven, who, who basically tried to make the point that science and policy are very different worlds. They've got very different demands. They've got uh, different drivers. So if you, if you look on one side, you know, the, the policy domain, they're looking for science being quite applied and targeted. They're looking for it to be packaged up quite quickly. They're looking for it to be quite simplified uh, with some really, well, how much will I save? What is the probability? And that kind of reductive um, angle where politics needs to function. Um, and on the other side, we have the scientific domain, which is uh, much more long-term in some of the things we're trying to do. We, are, we do engage with uncertainty and complexity in a way which the policymakers struggle. And so we have different credibility demands. On one side, relevance, and on one side is science and objectivity. And so in between the two is one of the reasons 
why science gets messy and why some of the issues around the translation of science into policy and beyond into sort of even community action is quite difficult to achieve. And so I wanted to just end up with a, a couple of reflections. And I quite like this. This is an editorial in a New Zealand national newspaper. And I really do admire their optimism. You know, climate change is too important for politics. But the reality is, is that it is intensely political. And the data that we produce becomes political too. And there's not much you can do about that. You can't depoliticize some of the scientific data because the, well, the implications are so important. And so one of the things I wanted to stress today was this idea that there's limits in what science can do and provide. And it, it can't, for example, um, manage how the data is used in quite an easy way, particularly when some of the information is quite uncertain and it stretches forward decades, for example and there's other polarized politics attacking it. So there's, there's always a sense that politics is always functioning. I think the, the second point I wanted to make was about the nature of institutions who use that. Um, I mean, bureaucracies are quite interesting beasts, you know, that they're, they're, they're actually designed to deliver similar outcomes in similar ways. And, and that's one of the functions of efficiency that they do really well. And, um, and so, some of the things that climate science demands is around adaptability, transformation, flexibility, and it's quite a different set of institutional demands. So I'm um, thinking about the institutions as just being quite, you know, it's quite hard for them to assimilate some of the knowledge that we produce in ways. And um, this last one is just understand, understand the importance of forces that resist change. So this image is from one of our research areas, which was looking at managed retreat from the coast. Um, and I'll just read out the sign. It says, leave our, leave our homes alone, watch out the rest of New Zealand, you're next. This idea of data setting, or providing the underpinning evidence for policy, which then has this ripple effect across, um, across the country. And this, this idea that while we might research climate risk or technical understandings of risk and probability, is that that then has to become assimilated within political risk. There's a risk to acting on the data that we might produce. And I think that's a really good way for me to, to end really, is that one of the things I try and to, to research is looking at beyond the technical understandings of risk to so the political dimensions of acting on that risk. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're looking at is that if science can't provide all the answers, then maybe we use it in a different way. And maybe part of the role of science is, is to provide the space for politics to function. We can provide new flood risk maps, which we can then go and speak to communities around implications or values or pathways forward. And so science isn't necessarily about the answers. It's just part of the, the process by which we get to the further questions we need to debate. I just a uh, wider reading because I'm academic and we have to do these kind of things if we, we cite stuff. But um, that's me and I'll hand over to the, the questions now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was also really thought thought provoking. And um, I think we've got a whole bunch of um, questions. I think it, we're not going to solve today, but I really hope we can uh, perhaps tease some of them out. Um, so I've got a few, just a couple of uh, pre-prepared questions and then we'll, I see some coming into the chat. So please do keep them coming. I think you've, um, you've all outlined um, that we have really big challenges right now about sharing um, climate research and climate data. Um, is there anything kind of coming up that we have challenges ahead that we haven't considered or are there areas where you think that the challenge is going to get worse? And maybe I'll start with Andy. I mean, is that, where do you think this is going? Uh, it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm not good at predicting. I'm a climate scientist, so I, I do 2050, not 2023, because I don't like being shown to be wrong. Um, so there are things coming. The first is a data explosion. Uh, climate scientists are now talking about exascale and we don't know how to do that, but 
the quantity of data that's coming is going to be truly enormous, which does open up the fundamental question of how to connect climate science with decision making. And I do think we are going to have to establish substantial teams of knowledge brokers, uh, translating services, so that the, the modeling data, the simulations are used appropriately. I don't, there's been hints of that being done in the UK, hints of that being done in various places, but it's always one or two people. I think the scale of decisions that are going to be made from, um, from a con context of climate risk are going to become enormous. Um, many countries now have multi-billion dollar adaptation investment funds. But actually, the truth is how to align that investment with risk is very much a work in progress. So I think I think what will emerge over the next five years are large teams of people who provide translation services. If I could just add on the back of that, that's a great point, because one of the things that you know, we were observing with the COVID response was the the use of data in, in backing up some of the decisions in, in, in quite a real time you know, way. And so we all became quite data literate within a short amount of time. Flattening the peak became um, something we were, we were all of a sudden people were modeling experts um, who had no interest in models before. And so there is this idea around data literacy and, and presenting data in a way that it can make sense to diverse communities. Um, I think on, on the back of that, the other thing which I'm, I'm just conscious of is this, you know, in the same time as we've seen the rise in data, there's also a, a distrust in experts among some political quarters. And I don't know how we reconcile uh, that when um, you know, we can use data in a way where you know, if, we, if the stakes are quite high, is that sometimes people don't you know, like the messages and attack the experts. And, and that, that's a, a, something you see with, again, in managed retreat, We've had instances where communities have actually um, procured their own um, flutterous model to challenge the existing institutional model, for example, which was a really good way to think about, you know, not necessarily the weaponizer of data, but creating enough doubt by which you can maintain the status quo. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting how that we, as you say, we've there had this COVID has led to this kind of challenging and uh, increased interest in in sort of information. Tanya, did you want to add anything to that? What do you think the challenges are for the future? Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think the challenges have been quite clearly laid out. Um, yeah, I, 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 I see. Um, I do see the flood of data and information becoming hugely problematic. Um, I mean, if I can just speak from, from the perspective of um, accounting research, um, most accounting research is quantitative in nature. Um, and I know that I have many colleagues who would probably love to get their hands on um, on climate data and um, who would use it to, you know, to try and predict. Um, and I, I'm using that word quite consciously, although that's not necessarily the correct term to use, but it's the term that they would probably use um, to predict changes in capital market, market flows or, you know, arising as a consequence of, of future climate events. Um, but my concern is, because I've seen it with respect to greenhouse gas information, um, is that they clump all of this data together, um, be it scope one, scope two or scope three, in the case of greenhouse gas information, without any concern for the fact that the so indirect greenhouse gas emissions um, the way in which they're measured, what the numbers represent, there might be deep uncertainties behind it compared to other types of greenhouse gas measurements, which are around direct emissions. Um, and uh, they take the data at face value. 
Um, it's, it's also correct that in the financial statements, for example, or in, in the, the conceptual framework, which is the underpinning of, um, it's, it's sort of like the, the guidebook to how to interpret the accounting standards. Um, uncertainty has a very, very, in my opinion, um, I, I, I've spoken, discussed it with accountants and auditors and they would dispute this, but in my opinion, it has a very minor role. It doesn't really, it's not, uncertainty itself isn't well represented. It appears in little footnotes and there's often um, no quantitative um, description associated with it. There's very little uh, contextual information provided with respect to uncertainty. Um, and so numbers are seen very much by quantitative accountants and quantitative um, finance, financial analysts, often as just what they are, <laughs> you know, um, which it, it, it puzzles me, but that's, that's just the way it is. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's something, you know, I would love to really try and push against that, but I know other colleagues have tried to do that for a long time. It hasn't worked. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Great. Jenny. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question for you in the chat, which I will I'll go to and then we'll come back to some other ones. So the question is about the top down model that you mentioned. Um, so in your in your opinion, is who's the top for climate issues? Is it inter international organisations such as the UN? Is it governments? And given current geopolitical tensions, is the top down way even feasible? OK, this is probably more a question for Andy. I'll, I'll just I'll just do a quick. There, so I was talking about two different things, which may have been a bit confusing. So I apologise. Um, these climate service providers are developing their own top down models. Now, what's inside of them, I don't know, and and none of us really know because they're proprietary models. But there are also top down models that have been developed for the purposes of the uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change and the reports that are coming up that that they produce. And you can talk much, much more to that. They're a very different kettle of fish. Um, so, uh, yeah, I might just pass that one on to Andy. Yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Who's the top one? Who's the top top down model? <laughs> well, th yeah, th there's no such thing as a top mm. uh, yeah. as the best model or anything like that. So it depends what your problem is. If you're interested in global sea level rise, there are very simple models which allow you to uh, model the risk of sea level rise based upon a whole range of different scenarios. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when you use one of these highly simplified aggregated models to assess climate risk over Auckland or Sydney. And my, my view is that might work if the only thing you're vulnerable to is temperature. If you're vulnerable to annual temperatures, might be all right. But for those of you interested in climate risk and you think what drives climate risk are extreme events, compounding events where you get severe rain and severe winds at the same time, or compound events where you get a extremely heavy rainfall event of one place followed by another one a week later, followed by another one a week later, those top-down methods do not work. They're, they're not designed for that purpose. Uh, if the question is asking who should you listen to in terms of organ international organizations on climate science, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, I honestly don't think there's a better uh, reliable and robust source of information. It's not perfect, it's a bit conservative um, because of the nature of the way it's set up. But if I wanna know something I don't know about in terms of climate, I go to the IPCC reports. Great, thank you for that. I think it is it is kind of a really interesting question about the sort of where that where the top is in these kind of models. And you're right that there's often a feeling that we we're not you know we're not able to translate things right down to a local level. Um, can I just ask a question about the solution? So Andy, you talked about uh, you wanted we're asking. Hopefully, this we might come up with some solution to the question you've asked. Um, do you think the solutions to what, how we share and manage 
climate data are. They're more cultural, more technical. And I'm just struck with all of the things that you've all three of you have said is about the need for the data brokers, the, the who are the synthesizers and such like. Where do you see the solutions coming from? Is anybody addressing this? Well, I could probably make a quick start on that. I know what the solution is, but it's not achievable. We need vastly more very well scientifically and technically trained data scientists that co coincidentally have excellent training in social sciences to act as the interface between the very quantitative climate modeling and the fact that decisions should always really be made within a social science uh, contextualization of risk. And, you know, best of luck finding them. And, and if we do train them, they're nicked by the financial sector, the banks, the, and a whole range of other research fields that are desperate for kids with excellent technical and scientific training in STEM. So what we probably need to do is substantially grow our undergraduate programs in those areas um, to manage the demand that, that, um, that is emerging for those sorts of very talented people. And uh, that goes all the way back to something that a lot of you would do, I'm sure, go talk to schools about how important STEM is and how important social sciences are in finding solutions to climate change um, and really, really encouraging people to keep their um, relevant skills under development as they go through undergraduate programs. We need an awful lot more talented people. Hey. Can I just uh, add to that? I think it's a, a really good point is that this idea is that um, we need the right data in the right format to the right audience at the right time. And, and, it, and it's the idea that you've got to have um, to do that. You need a particular different, you know, it, it's multiple data sets. And if any one of those is missing, then decision making doesn't occur. So a, a really good example is, you know, say you've got a really good technical model on 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 risk, but you don't have an economic model on how much is it going to cost to act on that, or you know, you know, or, or what kind of thresholds is damage and loss and those kind of aspects. And so you're really looking at multiple data sets coalescing around one particular problem that's based in a territory. And, and so that's part of the challenge is the way that we package information and make it spatially relevant and in order for decision making to, to proceed. So we we did a paper last year where we talked about uncertainty has always been a contagion. If it's in the technical domain, it stretches to the policy domain. If it's in the economic domain, it stretches to the politics domain because you don't know enough to act. And so you need to have certainty in multiple domains in order to, to get the action. That's a, that's a really interesting point, the uncertainty is a contagion, because sometimes we talk about, you know, the need for, you know, we have to embrace some degree of uncertainty when we're thinking about scientific research, but that's very anxiety provoking if you're not a, not with it, not, not a, you know, an academic. Tanya, what, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? In finance, there's uncertainty all the time. <laughs> So uncertainty is not something we are unfamiliar with. It's just that we expect, and this is something that uh, Naomi or Eskis has also written about, um, we expect we a higher bar for, from the sciences. We expect them to be more certain than financial markets or than economics because we know that financial markets and economics rely on human behaviour, um, whereas science we expect that physics can tell us something that will be certain um so i think it's actually i do think there's a cultural element to this i think there's an element to under for, you know around um educating um what science can and cannot deliver and understanding that the fact that science cannot deliver certainty does not mean that science is failing um and it's also about just the same as in accounting, um, a lot of accounting, the numbers that are created, it's through judgment. It's using exper expertise to make a judgment call uh, based on the contextual information that you have to hand. So I do think it's about employing similar, um, similar processes 
but in a different context. And it's in a context that we're not yet comfortable with because it revolves around science. Yeah. Just to expand on that a bit, one of the um, one of the sessions that we have later in the week is around, around climate journalism, and I just wonder if uh, you have any views on what we should be hoping for and expecting from journalists when when we're sort of talking about the the climate um, data and information. Is what is their role? Because there's some really great data journalism that I think clearly actually does has done a really good piece of work on um, promoting it. But what, what else should we perhaps be expecting? Are you asking me, Ginny? Well, or... Whoever would like to take that. <laughs> Someone else want to go? Uh, I could go quickly first. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to the New Zealand journalists. I think they've really been outstanding over the last few years. Things have changed uh, over here. It might be related to the, uh, media ownership, which is quite different from uh, over the ditch. But some of the journalism is excellent. There's still a, there's still a tendency. Um, so just, okay, how much is it going to cost? You know, what's that figure to try and get that headline amount about things being expensive or other things, which is part of journalism. But we, I think that some of the, some of the, the changes we've seen in the last three or four years, I think has been brilliant. I don't have any real complaints about New Zealand data journalism or climate journalism at the moment. I think that they're, they're really um, excellent. That it still struggles to work well. You've still got to work out, okay, what now? And that's where things do get much more subjective and, and who pays in particular and what do we do with existing land uses? Um, but all those issues are, are, are you know, are, are really ripe for journalism to lean into. Oh, look, it, it, it's not quite that rosy in Australia. Um, <laughs> As a climate scientist, I read articles in the media and I really wish they were being written by journalists with some science training. And I, and I would reflect on how um, e The Guardian writes a lot about climate and every event is clearly climate change. And The Australian writes a lot about climate and they write about how it can't possibly be climate change. And the quality of science journalism in Australia has been going backwards. Um, there are very, very few card carrying science journalists left in Australia. And I think it's very regretful because it's it's hard and it's nuanced and it needs it needs some training. And I think I mean, maybe it's good in data reporting, but it. But the, the, the stuff I see in most of the technological areas, high performance computing and so forth, is, is not very nuanced. There's exceptions, of course. Yeah. And I'm guessing that would be the case also for you know, business uh, data and pre presentation there as well. It's, uh, it's such a complex area that it's not often not well presented. So I think we're almost at the end. I'm, I'm going to... Um, if. I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to say finally before we wrap up. I, I guess my message that I felt came from this, I don't think we solve, came up with any solutions for Andy, but I do think you've made a very powerful case, all of you, for the need for people who can you know, understand the data and synthesize it and be able to translate it. And clearly, if anybody here is thinking about training as a data scientist who wants to be good at translating, there is there is work for you to do here. It's, um, it's uh, an incredibly important um, uh, position for us to be thinking about. Um, so I think unless there's anything you'd like to finally say, we'll wrap this up. I will just quickly share my screen and um, just highlight that we have a, uh, more sessions coming up uh, throughout the week. Uh, one on journalism, we have one on Wiki, Wikimedia, and we have uh, other se panel sessions on climate and climate and justice. So thank you very much to our speakers. This was a really fascinating session. I don't think we came up with solutions, but I hope we have triggered some thoughts for people to take away. And, um, you know, if there's any follow up to this, please, please just get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>